Daniel chapter 7, Daniel chapter 8, Daniel chapter 9. There are a number of prophetic passages that relate to what? The rise of the Antichrist. So that's what we're looking at here today. And we got a little timeline chart. We looked last week at Daniel chapter 2. We found out that as a result of, we briefly mentioned the 70 weeks of Daniel prophecy where God punished Israel by sending them into captivity for how long, Steve? 70 years. And the reason why they sent in captivity for 70 years was because Israel was supposed to do what to the land, Steve? Was supposed to let the land rest for one millennial day or day of the week of the years out of the seven. So you have seven days in a week in a growing farming community like the nation Israel, you have seven years in an agricultural week. So you were supposed to rest the land every seventh year. And since Israel failed to do that for the course of 490 years, what we wound up doing is establishing a timeline for the 70 weeks of Daniel where 490 years were turned into 490 prophetic years. So when God divided seven into the 490, he came up with the number 70 so that there would be 70 years that Israel would have to spend out of the land to allow the land to enjoy her Sabbath days. That's how Israel wound up the blue. That's how Israel wound up in captivity in Babylon for 70 years. Uh, got our Michigan people, biggest alumni base in the world, and they come down here frequently. So, okay, so just to recap, we found out Israel's now in Babylon, so God uses a pagan king, Nebuchadnezzar. Nebuchadnezzar, right here on the timeline, this is the fall in the Garden of Eden, Adam and Eve. This is the second coming of Christ. Eventually went to war. 
war against the Trojans to, you know, dominate that particular area of the world at the time. And, you know, Homer and uh, Virgil wrote about that in the Iliad and the Odyssey, the, the epic uh, related to the Trojan War. After that period of time, another Grecian leader came along by the name of Philip of Macedon. He was based in the city-state of Macedonia. And in Macedonia, he began again trying to unite the three states of the Grecian Empire together into one big world empire. He wasn't successful at it, but his son was. The son of Philip of Macedon was none other than Alexander the Great. And Alexander the Great is the third king that's referenced, uniting the world together under the third great world empire, the Grecian Empire of Alexander the Great, which supplanted and, and replaced Persian Empire that had replaced the Babylonian Empire. And then the fourth and final of the kingdoms was the kingdom that was described in the metallic man tree of Nebuchadnezzar as two legs of iron. We know that that is a type or a shadow or a picture God gave Nebuchadnezzar of the Roman Empire. Now what do we know about the Roman Empire? The Roman Empire, we found out, was divided into two. Just like a man has two legs, the Roman Empire was started out based in Rome, eventually divided into two. Why? Because Emperor Constantine decided that he thought the East was more exotic and more beautiful, and eventually he decided to move the capital of Rome from the city of Rome, in what we now call the country of Italy, in the West, he decided to move it eastward to the city of what we now call, what they are called Byzantium. And Byzantium was renamed what? It was named Constantinople. Constantinople, we're familiar with that name, is named after the Emperor Constantine. It means the metropolis or the city of Constantine. So that's where Constantine moved his new empire. And so you had a division of the Roman Empire into east and west. And so those are the two legs of iron because they were stronger and harder than any other. But what is uh, most mysterious and confusing for many people is the feet on the legs of iron. The Roman Empire was never defeated or destroyed. It sort of receded into nothingness as the Goths and the Visigoths, the barbarians in Britannia sort of pushed the Roman Empire out. They were never defeated in a war the way the Persians were and the way uh, the Babylonians were. It just sort of dissipated. And that dissipation will come again. It is that Roman Empire that will be revived again and what is depicted here as the two feet of the iron leg metallic band. And it was at that point that we ended last week when we got to uh, Daniel chapter 2, verse 43. This very mysterious and strange verse that talked about the interpretation thereof and how many Bible scholars believe that this fourth kingdom, the Roman Empire, when it revives itself again as the two feet of the two legs of iron, it will be made up of human beings and non-human beings. In other words, persons who are not human. And so that's kind of weird and strange. You're like, oh, wait, what are you talking about? This is science fiction. Science fiction is really just a laying out, a foreshadowing of things that will later come to pass. Like they used to have science fiction movies about people traveling to the moon. And back in the 1920s, you could see some of the very first movie films where they'd have, they didn't even have sound, but they'd have a rocket ship flying into the moon and crashing into the surface of the moon. Later, on July 20th of 1969, pursuant to John F. Kennedy's decision to throw his head over the wall of space and to get America to the moon first, we found out that that science fiction became science fact. So what I'm saying, suggesting to you is what we see in the movies, the Avengers, Captain America, Superman, Spider-Man, all of these movies about the superheroes is really a reiteration of what Virgil and Homer were writing about in the Iliad and the Odyssey, about superpowered beings who were the heroes of old. Genesis chapter 6 verse 1 to 4 foretells the time when fallen angels of heaven came down and interbred with human females because they were beautiful. They married them impregnated them and created, brought about, became the genesis of a whole brand new race of individuals called in the Bible the Nephilim, the fallen one, Superman. And the Bible says these were the heroes 
of old upon which great writers wrote about. What Genesis chapter 6 verse 4 is making reference to is Homer and Virgil and all of those great writers from ancient Roman history, ancient Grecian history who wrote about Hercules and Thor from the Scandinavians. If you're of a Nordic background, if you're Norwegian, or if you're Finnish, you, you won't have Zeus and Hercules. You'd have Thor and Odin and all of the gods of Asgard for the Scandinavian people. And so all of those individuals are really just uh, sort of stylized stories about entities that actually did exist on the earth, which is why the flood of Noah occurred right here on our timeline chart. God had to destroy the world from the flood to kill off, not human beings because they were sinful. So human beings have been sinful since the fall in the Garden of Eden and continue to be sinful. God doesn't destroy New York City with the flood every day. He doesn't destroy, you know, Bourbon Street in New Orleans with the flood every day. He doesn't destroy, you know, uh, Vegas, for goodness sake, with the flood, or even South Beach, you know, uh, wherever sinful people are. God doesn't send a flood to kill them. What was happening there was a situation where the hybridized humanoids were dominating the human beings. The sons of Adam were being dominated by what the Bible were that Genesis chapter 6 verse 4 is making reference to. And these supermen were dominating the earth and God destroyed them with a flood. That's why we have demons today, disembodied spirits of these supermen. But just because you went to the movies and saw the Avengers and said, well, you know, uh, Thor can fly through the air using his magic hammer or Superman can fly through the air using his cape and all this stuff, it's, it's fictional. It's fictional now because we're not seeing it with our eyes. Remember, a few decades back, movies about going to the moon were fictional as well because no one had ever done it until July 20th of 1969 when the first man set foot on the moon. So all of the movies from the 1920s about moon travel that were science fiction aren't fiction anymore because it came to pass. And what I'm suggesting is that the Bible is teaching that the return of these supermen or heroes to the earth was predicted in the Bible certainly see in modern day human genetic engineering, we now know that there's a gene editing device called the CRISPR-Cas9 that can cut the genes out of one type of organism and place them into the genome of a different type of organism to create what? A third type of entity or organism that doesn't exist. See? The chimera. That, and the term chimera is actually from ancient Greek mythology. They use it in science now. So to make reference to a chimerical entity is making reference to an entity that's made up of more than one type or kind of creature. That used to be Greek mythology. And so Steve mentioned the word chimera, C-H-I-M-E-R-A. Chimera used to be a mythical monster made up of many different types of creatures, like the head of a bull, the legs of a goat, wings of an eagle. That was in Greek mythology. But now in science, that same name has been adopted and applied to what scientists are doing in laboratories all over the world. They're taking the genes of one type of creature and combining together with the genes of another type of creature and then create a new entity or creature that never existed at any time during the history of the planet Earth. So what we would have called centuries ago science fiction is now science fact. The ability to combine humans with non-humans is something that's done in laboratories every single day all over the world. Now there are rules and laws in place that when you create an embryo using part human DNA with non-human DNA, you can't allow that embryo to develop past a certain stage. You have to destroy it or otherwise in the United States it's against the law. But what's going on in laboratories in China or in other parts of the world that aren't as uh, quite as you know, you know, sensitive to moral issues. So the idea that I'm positing to you, based upon what we're reading in the book of Daniel, is that the Bible is saying that once upon a time on the earth, there were supermen who were mistakenly referred to as gods, who were really mighty heroes because they had genetic material of non-humans that made them bigger, better, stronger, faster than many humans. We have that same idea in the Olympic Games, you know, steroids and human growth hormones have been outlawed because they give the athlete a competitive advantage in running, say, the 100 meters. The new thing in athletic cheating is gene doping, where you take the genes of a superior athlete and combine them together with the genes of another individual to create a Superman. So where we used to have blood doping, drugs, and chemicals, we can now gene dope by changing or tweaking the genes of an athlete to make them superior to any 
normally born human beings. So again, what once upon a time was science fiction later becomes science fact. The idea that there will be persons or entities that can interact, can walk and talk, and even have sexual relations with a woman who are not humans, that's in the Bible. That's also in science fiction. That's what the superhero comic books are about. That's what Spider-Man, Superman, Thor, the Avengers, Captain America, that's what that is all about. But the fact that it's in a book called a comic book or once upon a time it was fictional doesn't mean that it can't come true. And in fact, that it hasn't already come true. And so that is what the Bible is talking about. So now we're going to get to the point where we cut it, we ended last week when the metallic man was being interpreted by Daniel. And so we uh, will pick it up. Let's just see. Um, take a look at Daniel chapter 2. When we got to verse 26, Daniel is now revealing this dream of the metallic man, which we have depicted right here in our timeline chart. And this is what Daniel said. Daniel answered and said, secret, which your wise men and magicians can't show to the king. I can show you. He says, there is a God in heaven that reveals secrets and maketh known to King Nebuchadnezzar what shall be in the latter days. In other words, God was giving Nebuchadnezzar information that uh, was to be considered during the last days. This is the way it's going to be in the last days. This is what Jesus is referring to in Matthew 24, the Olivet Discourse, when he says, as it was in the days of Noah, so it shall be in the days of the coming of the Son of Man. In other words, when Jesus comes back in the second coming, he's going to come back to a world that is dominated, ruled over by non-human persons that the Bible collectively refers to as the Nephilim. And so you might say, wait, where did that come from? It came from the book of uh, Matthew, chapter 24, where Jesus says it's going to be just like it was in the days of Noah. How was it in the days of Noah? In the days of Noah, God had to destroy the whole world with the worldwide flood to wipe out the gene pool of a non-human race or group of entities that were threatening to interbreed the human race out of existence. That's why God used the severity of the flood of Noah to kill off the organisms that had human DNA spliced together, combined together with non-human uh, uh, organisms. So when, when you hear talk of you know combining human DNA or changing the human DNA, people talk about the mark of the beast in Revelation chapter 13, which some believe to be a biogenetic chip that would rewrite or change the DNA of a person. What once upon a time was a fictionalized, you know, group of stories or beliefs, or maybe this could happen. We already know that changing human DNA is a possibility and it's done, you know, generally the argument is for uh, you know medical purposes to help people or things things of that nature. You can take you know the genes that create a human ear, put them into a body of a mouse, and grow a human ear on the back of a mouse. We've been able to do that since about 2002, 2000. And, and the argument is that well, if somebody gets into a terrible car crash like Tiger Woods a few days ago, or somebody gets horribly disfigured in a fire and they lose their ear, which can actually happen because the human skin can actually melt. I mean, as a prosecutor, I've tried cases of attempted murder where people set other people on fire, and the description of the burning person was that their skin melted like wax from their body. So if a human being loses their ear, then that person would be able to go to one of these hybridized mice and they cut the human ear off the mouse and sew it back onto the body of the person that lost it in a tragedy. Now, the mouse would die, but the human would get an ear again. So I, I don't have a moral problem with the mouse dying so a human can live. But what we do have a problem with is when we start going cross species into different combining of different types of animals and creatures together to form a third hybrid, we find out that Genesis chapter 1, Genesis chapter 2, and the book of Leviticus, this is squarely and totally condemned by the Bible and the Word of God. So does God want us to be able to combine a uh, human with an animal? No, because it is strictly forbidden in Scripture. Now, in Scripture, the Bible condemns bestiality. But one of the interesting rules about bestiality, when a human has sexual relations with an animal, that's considered an abomination. You would stone under the nation of Israel, you would stone the person that does that to death. But interestingly enough, under the law of Moses, not only would you kill the person that rapes and sexually abuses the animal, but you'd have to kill the animal too. Why is that? The animal is the victim. Is it possible that God has acknowledged that while he set up barriers to make it hard, cross-species interbreeding, that it 
line was gold. The images hit a fine gold, breast of uh, uh, an arm of silver, belly and thighs brass, legs of iron and feet. Part of iron and part of clay. That's verse 33. Then he says in verse 34, he thou saw a stone cut out without hands that hit the image on his feet, depicted right here, and destroyed all of the kingdoms and turned them into dust. Daniel says in verse 36, okay, that was your dream, king. A big stone hit the metallic man in the feet and destroyed all the kingdoms of the world. Now I'm going to tell you, Daniel says, what that really means. And so he goes on and interprets it. In verse 38, he says, thou, O king, are the head of gold. So Nebuchadnezzar is this guy. Nebuchadnezzar is the head of gold on the metallic man. And then he goes on to say, the other uh, bits of metallic body parts are kingdoms inferior in you that'll come along after you. And he talks about the chest of silver. That's the Medo-Persian Empire uh, of the Persians and Darius the Great, who's the leader of uh, the Medes, combined together with the Persians to form the media persian Empire that supplanted the Babylonian Empire. And that's, then he makes reference to the kingdom of brass, which shall over the earth. That's making reference to Alexander the Great and the United Grecian Empire, which eventually overthrew the Media Persian Empire. And then he makes reference in verse 40 to a fourth kingdom, which shall be strong as iron, for inasmuch as iron breaketh in pieces and subdueth all things, as iron breaketh, it shall break into pieces and bruise. But then in verse 41, 42, and 43, he gets to a very strange determination or description of the feet of this fourth kingdom of iron. He goes on to say, Whereas thou sawest the feet and the toes of potter's clay and part of iron, the kingdom shall be divided, but there shall be strengthening of iron. For as much as thou sawest iron mixed with miry clay. Miry is in the English King James Version which can be translated earthly clay. We know that God made Adam's body out of the clay of the ground or the dirt. That's why he was called Adam, because he was red. Think of the red clay of Georgia, you know, the ground upon which most of the state of Georgia lies on is covered with reddish brown clay. So the red clay, Adam or Adam, so that's where we get to the word Adam, like uh, in Israel. When I studied over there, instead of the Red Cross, they had the Magen David Adam which is Hebrew, a red shield of David. Red and David are associated with one another because that's the etymological root of the name Adam, what it means, ready, ruddy, or reddish. And so the reddish-brown skin color of Adam may be similar to what you see right today, right here, uh, again, is etymologically relating Adam to the clay from which he came. His body was made out of clay. It was when God breathed into the clay man that he came alive and the man became a living being. So the Spirit of God went in when God made the clay body come alive. But bodies can be created and bodies can be constructed from biogenetic material. Clay has uh, you know, materials in it. If you take a, a, a clump of soil, it's got all kinds of living nutrients and minerals, which is why the land of Israel had to give the land year off so that those living subatomic particles can come back to life in the soil. That's why you, farmers take off and grow one field for three years and then they the other field they give a year off, right? So that the nutrients that live in the dirt can come back to life again. Because if you keep growing straight through, you'll deplete or leach all of the living nutrients out of the soil. The soil dies, once the soil dies, you can plant a million seeds in it and nothing's so that is what God is using as a type or a metaphor or a picture with the feet of the fourth kingdom, the legs of iron. He says this, he says, verse 42 of Daniel 2, it says, And as the toes and the feet were part of iron, and 
Roman. That's the reference to the earthly or miry clay. And part would be non-human, which is a reference to the iron, which is bigger, stronger, harder than a human being. That's why Achilles was able to kill all of the Trojan warriors, you know, hundreds at a time, because he was bigger, stronger, harder than any normal soldier would be. That's why Hercules was considered this gigantic, heroic figure in Greek mythology, because he was harder and stronger. The iron is making reference to the Nephilim human noids, not human beings, but the humanoid beings, supernatural beings in human form that have bigger powers, greater powers, and are looked at either as heroic figures like in the comic books or godlike figures, which is what we found in most of the people in ancient times who looked at these superpowered people, consider them gods, and wrote stories about them and drew pictures of them. Look at Egyptian mythology. You see Horus, who is the jackal-headed god, who worshipped and had a human body with the head of a dog, basically. Uh, then you had Horus, who was the falcon-headed god. He had the body of a man, but he had the head of a falcon. He could talk, and apparently he could fly as well. And so he was worshipped as a god. But because he had the genome of a non-human sliced in to the genome of a human to give him superpowers, which is why when we go to the comic book movies, we look at our heroes and say, oh, it's Superman, he came to save the day. Oh, it's Thor, it's Captain America. It's some superpowered human coming to save the day and rescue the mere mortal humans that are non-superpowered. That is what Daniel chapter 2, verse 42, seems to be implying. That the kingdom will be divided out between real Adamic human beings like you and I, and those of you guys out of YouTube land, I'm assuming all of you are regular genetically Adamic human beings and don't have superpowers to can't fly through the air. If there came a time when a whole army, and that's what you know the military is doing in the United States and in Russia and in China, they are studying the science of how to enhance the abilities of human beings. Why? So they can create the world's first super soldier. Whoever gets the army of the world's first super soldier wins the battle, right? If everybody in your army is Superman, Captain America, or the Hulk, you're going to beat up the army that doesn't have anything but regular people, right? So that's what the best scientists in the world are helping the military do now. The DARPA or Defense Advanced Research Projects Administration is a subsection of the Pentagon, and they're trying to do that, and they'll use genetics to do it, and they'll use any kind of scientific angle to do it for the good of, you know, American safety and national security. But the, but the Chinese will do the same thing with their scientists, and the Russians, goodness forbid, will do the same thing with their scientists. The Russians, under the former Soviet Union, were way ahead of everybody else. Remember, during the Olympics back in the 70s, the Russian or Soviet athletes oftentimes had government help from the government scientists. And they were the guys that first learned how to use steroids to make your muscles bigger and stronger, or human growth hormones, or blood doping, things of that nature, to give you a tactical, competitive, athletic advantage in an international competition that brought glory and honor to your nation state. So the Russian scientists were helping under the former Soviet Union, the state-run athletes, to be bigger, better, and stronger through advanced science. And we should expect that that continues bear right on. I mean, what's more important? Winning a gold medal in the Olympics or winning World War III? So I can assure you, the Chinese want to win. If there's a World War III, and there will be, the Chinese are going to want to win. And the Russians are going to want to win. And the Americans are going to want to win. Whoever is competing in the final, last big war that the Bible says is coming and depicts in Revelation chapter 19 and refers to as Armageddon when all the nations of the world come together to battle, Everybody wants to win. So, is the Bible saying, and I would submit to you that it is saying in Daniel chapter 2, verse 42, that the army of the last world ruler who will be ruling over the revived Roman Empire, an individual that John, in John chapter, the uh, third epistle of John in the New Testament, refers to as the Antichrist. Daniel refers to this individual that John calls the Antichrist. Daniel calls him the man of sin, the son of perdition, uh, you know, and gives the little horn, hey, God bless you, man. And so
so Daniel and John are talking about the same entity, the ruler over the revival Roman Empire, the feet of the iron leg fourth empire that's made up of iron and earthly clay, will be made up of the Nephilim Superman that we read about in Greek and Norse mythology and regular human beings. Now let's go on to verse 43 and see what Daniel says there. Daniel chapter 2 verse 43 continues on in this line and says this, whereas thou sawest iron mixed with miry or earthly clay, they shall mingle themselves with the seed of men, but they shall not cleave to one another, even as iron is not mixed with clay. Let's go back and take those words apart and see if it doesn't support my supposition or proposition that has been promoted by Dave Hunt, Chuck Missler, I.D.E. Thomas, Bible prophecy scholars dating back to the 1920s have said the same thing. My position is that Daniel chapter 2 verse 42 is saying that there will be an army of the Antichrist in the last days and that the strong members of that kingdom of the Antichrist will be the Nephilim supermen who are enhanced genetically beyond human beings, which is what Revelation 13's Mark of the Beast is all about. You take the Mark of the Beast and you become genetically enhanced and you'll be able to participate fully in the kingdom of the Antichrist. If you don't, your head's cut off. Uh, but if you do take it, you can't be saved because why? Because God gets mad and you get a tattoo of 666 on your skin? No, because many people have suggested that the Mark of the Beast will be some type of biogenetic insert that is referred to as a tattoo or in the Greek karagma just means mark. It could be, I mean, it's been determined as a tattoo on the skin. But is that tattoo something that will go beneath the skin and begin to rewrite the DNA of the normal man to make him into a superman? And I would submit to you that the individuals that have suggested that are probably correct. So, verse 43 of Daniel chapter 2 is going along the same lines and saying that the Iron Man, and you have the, what, the, the biggest superhero in the Avengers, is what? Thor and Iron Man. And Iron Man is really a metaphor for a super Nephilim super being. And so what Marvel Comics refers to as an Iron Man, the Bible refers to as an entity made of iron that's stronger than the entities that are made of earthly clay. In other words, earthly clay means a son of Adam, a descendant biogenetically of the first man who was made of clay, right? And then came alive when God breathed into him. And so verse 43 says, as thou saw iron mixed, that means combined together with earthly or miry clay, they shall mingle themselves with the seed of men. Now Steve, you got the personal pronoun they being used in this sentence. themselves together with the seed and in the Bible seed in Hebrew is Zerah. Zerah is, is the word that's used in the place of spermatozoa. Remember when uh, Onan spilt his seed on the ground. In other words, God told Onan to impregnate a certain person to create uh, a tribe of people. Onan said, nope, I'm not doing it. And so he, he, he sexually gratified himself and spilt his seed on the ground and God got mad. The, the word seed is what we would call today in science, spermatozoa, oh, all right, I've got our Wolverines everywhere. Um, spermatozoa is what you would call it today in a medical scientific standpoint. In Hebrew, it would be referred to as zera or seed. I'm not talking about burpee seeds that we used to sell when we were in the Boy Scouts when we were kids growing up to raise money for, you know, new uniforms for the football team. It's talking about the biogenetic material, the spermatozoa and the sperm cells that live inside the spermatozoa uh, is the seed of men. And so the Bible says here in Daniel chapter 2 verse 43 that they, meaning persons, shall mingle themselves together with what? With the seed of men. Chuck Missler 
I think did the best job of pointing out, you know, with his his background and science and you know with his doctrine, you know, having gone through the naval academy, he was a really smart guy. He was like, if you use your common sense, what does it say there? It says whoever is doing the mingling with human seed have to themselves be something other than humans, right? They shall mingle themselves with the seed of men. So the minglers have to be non human to mingle their seed or their genetic material with the seed or genetic material of human beings, men. Men is just an idiom making reference to the whole human race. Um, so clearly verse 43 of Daniel chapter 2 making reference to the feet of the iron metallic man or the metallic man whose legs were of iron and feet were of iron and clay. That's a powerful argument or polemic in favor of the interpretation that the Nephilim will return to the earth in the last days before Jesus comes back at Armageddon to destroy the Antichrist and establish the kingdom of heaven on the earth at the city of Jerusalem and Israel. So then, now we, 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 we understand a little bit more in detail what it was that Jesus was talking about when he gave that very famous uh, message, uh, that, that talk at the Mount of Olives about the end of days where he gave his Olivet Discourse and his disciples pulled him aside later and said, Rabbi, what will be the sign of end? When will these things be? What will be the sign of the end and of your coming? And Jesus said that, be sure that you not be deceived. And then he goes and gives them an answer to their question. When will the end of the world be? What are the signs of the end of the world that's coming? He said that false Christianity will rise up and said, many will come in my name saying that I am Christ and will deceive many. What is he saying? He's saying that the church will be dominated over in the last days by a heretical apostate Christianity that will accurately say that Jesus is Christ but will say a lot of wrong things to deceive many. Paul makes reference to this in verses 1 through 12 of 2 Thessalonians chapter 2 where he says, he was, Paul was writing a letter in 2 Thessalonians chapter 2 to people that were part of the church who had thought the rapture that Jesus first mentioned in John chapter 14 verse 1, 2, and 3. I'm going away to my father's house. In my father's house there are many mansions. I'm going away to prepare a place for you. But if I go away, I will come again and receive you to myself so that where I am, up in my father's house, there you may be also. Jesus makes reference to that at the Last Supper in John chapter 14. Paul writes to the Thessalonian church and to the Corinthian church in 1 Thessalonians chapter 4, verses 13 to 18, and in 1 Corinthians 15, verses 48 to 52, he goes into great detail about this event that we commonly refer to now as the rapture. When Jesus will snatch believers off the earth in their physical bodies, change them, and take them to the Father's house in heaven. And then the judgment of God, the day of the Lord's wrath, will begin. And it will begin by the Antichrist being released to make or reestablish the Roman Empire. The two legs of iron will be revived and re-coalesced. Only now it will be made up of non-humans. And CNN and cable TV and network news will probably say that they're the UFO extraterrestrial space brothers that landed on the Earth. Paul says a great deception will be coming after the rapture. But he, Paul writes those first 12 verses of 2 Thessalonians chapter 2 to alleviate the fear of what? Of the Christians who were living in Asia Minor, in the Roman Empire, that thought the rapture had already occurred and that they had been left behind. And Paul said, no, no, no. Remember I said to the Corinthians and Thessalonians that the dead of Christ rise first. And you're not in the day of the Lord, meaning that if the rapture had already occurred, then that means whoever's left behind is living through what we call here the final 70th week of Daniel, which is also known as the day of the Lord's wrath. Nobody is going to want to be on the earth during the seven-year period known as the day of the Lord's wrath. Why? Because God is going to be bringing judgment down on the earth. So these believers thought that the day of the Lord's wrath, the day of the Lord had already begun, meaning they had missed the rapture. 
your middle left eye. Paul said, no, no, don't worry. I told you before that certain things, the apostasy must come first. And then the man of sin will be revealed, who the Lord will destroy. The term apostasy in our English Bibles, in the Greek, is referred to or used the word apostasia. That's where we get the word apostasy from. Apostasia in the Greek means literally a departure. But there are twofold interpretations of that term departure. It can be a literal physical departure, or in context, it can also be a philosophical, rhetorical, ideological departure. So, Steve, once upon a time, you were an unbeliever. Let's say you were an atheist. You believed Darwinian science proved that God never existed. Then you went to a Dave Hunt or Herb Walker Bible study, and you were so impressed with the logic that flows from every page of the Bible that you decided to abandon your beliefs as a Darwinian, scientific, secular, humanist, atheist, and you became a follower of Jesus Christ. That would be a departure from your ideological platform, which was Darwinian evolution is the truth, there is no God, to biblical Christian view that Jesus is Lord and God created everything that is. That would be a departure. If Richard Dawkins becomes a born-again Christian before he dies, I don't think it's likely, but if it did happen, he would have ideologically departed from his secular humanist, evolutionary, God is dead stance to a biblical Christian stance. In fact, he did the opposite. He was raised in an Anglican Christian home, and when he was a kid, Richard Dawkins used to believe that the Bible was the word of God, and God created everything. But as he grew up, and his uh, older brother died of a disease, and he became hardened towards God because of a tragedy in his family, and as he got educated in the finer academically elite schools like Oxford, Cambridge, and England, he departed from his childhood belief in the Bible as the word of God that God created the universe. And he adopted a Darwinian evolution secular humanist view of the explanation for the universe. So that is the word apostasia applied rhetorically, philosophically to Richard Dawkins. He departed from believing in the Bible to believing the Bible is false and believing that the universe created itself. That's an apostasia rhetorically, philosophically, ideologically. But apostasia, the Greek word there, can also mean a literal departure. So when Steve leaves his house in Miami Shores to come to South Beach so that he can help me do street evangelism here on Saturday mornings on Ocean Drive, he departs Miami Shores from Miami Beach. When I depart Miami Beach to go back to Ann Arbor to go to a Michigan football game in the fall, which I want to do uh, until the worldwide pandemic shut it down, um, I would depart Miami, usually via airplane, and I would fly through the air and land in Michigan, and very shortly would be in Ann Arbor, right? That is a physical departure, and that is exactly what Paul is using, and the Holy Spirit is using through Paul. The double-fold meaning of apostasia means rhetorical, ideological, and means physical. So Paul was telling the church that he was writing 2 Thessalonians to that, don't worry, you haven't been left behind, you're not in the day of the Lord, because the apostasy must come first. Meaning that the Holy Spirit is saying, not just to the Thessalonians there, and Thessaly was one of the cities that uh, Alexander the Great united together, and uh, Agamemnon united together for the Trojan War, parenthetically. So Thessalonica, which was known as Thessaly back in the days of, you know, Hector and Achilles and the Trojan War, existed all the way back from the time of the Trojan War up to the New Testament Bible, and continues on today as Thessalonica, or uh, what, what do they call it now? Uh, uh, Thessaloniki, or uh, yeah, that's the name that they use now. So in the Old Testament, it was referred to as Thessaly. In the New Testament, it is referred to as Thessalonia. So Paul is telling the Thessalonians that a departure has to, apostasy has to come first, meaning that at the time that the Antichrist arises in the day of the Lord, that the thing that has to happen first before Antichrist rules the world for that final seven years during the day of the Lord, that 
a departure ideologically, rhetorically, philosophically has to happen first. People that believe in the Bible, like Richard Dawkins did when he was a kid, will depart from a belief in the Bible as the real word of God to a new worldview that the Bible is not the word of God and that it's wrong. Paul says that's going to happen within the church. In other words, people who claim to be Christians aren't going to now say, I'm a secular humanist atheist like Richard Dawkins. They're going to say, I'm a believer in Jesus or the Messiah, but the Bible is wrong. And that's why they're going to believe that the Antichrist is a blue. All right, got a little green out here. Go blue, go blue. Oh, man, I've got, a, I've got one of the badges as well. So, again, think it out now. Jesus is saying in the last days, in Matthew chapter 24, he said one of the signs that the end is about to occur, the second coming, Armageddon is about to occur, is what? that people that claim to be followers of Jesus Christ will also believe lies and deceive many by teaching lies in the name of Jesus Christ. Apostasy in the church. Paul says the apostasy or the departure from biblical truth will come within the church, meaning that people rejecting biblical truth won't be the Zoroastrians or the Wiccans or Satanists or Hindus or Muslims. They'll be people that call themselves Christians within the church rejecting the biblical word of God and that's one of the signs that the rapture is about to occur which will allow for the rise of the Antichrist in the day of the Lord. The other thing, the other literal interpretation of apostasia is a physical departure. So what is the Holy Spirit saying when you take together 2 Thessalonians chapter 2 verses 1 through 12, what I think and what I think many Bible prophecy scholars has clearly pointed out that the only legitimate interpretation of Scripture is that 2 Thessalonians chapter 2 is saying that just as Jesus said in Matthew 24's Olivet Discourse, that the sign that the end of the world is about to occur is that people within the church who claim to be Christian will depart from biblical truth and will set up themselves teachers having itching ears that will teach heresies in the church, in the pulpits, on Christian television, on Christian radio, you'll hear a prosperity gospel, a name and claim a gospel, a gospel that accepts everything, but will not be consistent with biblical truth. That comes first, and then Paul says the other definition for apostasia will be a physical departure. What physical departure? The physical departure of the real born-again body of Christ, the five wise virgins of Matthew 25, and left behind will be the rest of contemporary corporate Christianity, individuals who are Christians in name only but were never born again. Those are the five unwise virgins of Matthew 25 who didn't have oil in their lamps, and when the wise virgins with oil, the Holy Spirit, got called into the master's house, five unwise virgins that are left behind banged on the door and said, let us in, let us in. And he says, I can't, I never knew you. And it's too late, the door's closed. That is a type or a picture of what will happen in the last days. What we're going to see is a departure from biblical doctrine in the Bible. We see that already happening. Every time you turn on Christian radio or Christian television, you hear a prosperity gospel, a name and claim a gospel. People who are Christian writers and preachers are millionaires. I know we've mentioned, you know, Billy Crone, I, 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 somebody posted his tax returns on the internet. Uh, 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 Billy Crone, the, the guy whose book I read that was so poorly written that I thought it was written by elementary school kids. But somebody posted his tax returns and, and it was a tax exempt entity that in 2017 he made a half million dollars on marketing the gospel of Jesus Christ and Bible prophecy. Some of the stuff I'm talking about for you guys for free, he made a half million dollars in 2017. And in 2018, he made uh, almost three quarters of a million. So, or actually, in 2017, a quarter of a million, and in 2018, a half a million. So somebody in two years of preaching and teaching Bible prophecy and talk about the Antichrist made three quarters of a million dollars in two years and didn't have to pay taxes on any of it because the church 
was a 501c3 tax exempt entity. So what I'm saying to you, Jesus said, people are gonna come in my name saying that I am Christ, that's true. But they're gonna deceive many. So you see the vast majority of these television and radio and popular media internet pastors and preachers, evangelists in the church supposedly that are making millions of dollars doing it, you know that those are part of the apostate preachers and teachers that Jesus said has to come first. And so Jesus said, look for apostasy in the church. Paul says the apostasy has to come first. And then Paul says, after the apostasy that Jesus predicted in the church in Matthew 24, that the rapture of the real church, the bride of Christ, would occur next. And then, 2 Thessalonians chapter 2, verse 1 through 12, then the man of sin, the Antichrist, the little horn, the guy Daniel was talking about, Daniel 2, will come forward. And then the day of the Lord's wrath will begin, also known as the 17th week of Daniel. That period of time will begin then. But not until apostasy comes into the church first, then the real church leaves the world in the rapture, then the Antichrist comes, and the day of the Lord, the 70th week of Daniel, begins. And then seven years later, Jesus comes back to establish the kingdom of heaven on earth, and we'll live happily ever after, starting out a thousand years here on the earth, and then out into eternity.